time you reach for the sugar bowl, try to imagine that it was once so rare and expensive, it was called white gold. Producing sugar from the sugar cane first took place in India. About 300 B.C., Alexander the Great's army reported seeing a reed that gives honey without bees growing there. This table sugar has many names. Mill white, plantation white, and crystal sugar. But it all comes from the sugar cane. It looks a lot like bamboo, with fully grown stalks that can measure up to six meters high. Here in the field, a worker pairs away the husk from a stalk of sugar cane, then chews the cane's raw pulp to extract the stalk's sweet juice. This machine harvests the cane by cutting it at the base. Rotating scrolls feed the cane to the chopper drums inside. As they chop the cane, a fan blows the lighter leaves and tops back onto the field. The heavier lengths of cane drop into the base of a conveyor, which feeds them into the transport bin that follows alongside. Trucks rapidly transport the cut cane to the sugar mill for processing. Once cut, sugar cane begins to lose its sugar content, and damage to the cane during harvesting accelerates this decay. At the mill, trucks empty their load onto a receiving table. It feeds a belt conveyor that takes the cane through two separate washes. The cane must be as clean as possible before extracting the juice. But first, the cane's hard structure is broken down inside this crusher, where rotating hammers break the cane into small pieces. A conveyor loads it into a milling tandem designed to extract the sweet juice from the crushed cane. In this milling tandem, the cane passes through a series of five or more consecutive mills. Large cylinders compress the cane fiber. The juice pours out of the milling tandem and diverts into a channel away from the bagasse the dry pulp that remains after extracting the juice. A worker supervises the operation at each of the mills. A vat collects the juice that flows from the top and bottom of the mills. Now that the juice is extracted from the sugar cane, it's time to process it. However, before turning the juice into sugar crystals, a sample goes through a series of tests at the sugar mill's laboratory. First, a technician adds a thickener that binds to impurities in the juice and then filters it to obtain a clear, clean juice. Then, he pours it into a polarimeter, a machine that measures the concentration of sugar. The juice from the mills now falls through this 10 meter high tower as sulfur dioxide vapors rise through it. This process, known as sulfitation, bleaches the juice. Then the juice flows through a device that measures its pH level. While at a separate vat, workers add powdered lime to water, preparing a solution to which they will then add the juice. An agitator mixes the cane juice and lime solution for about six hours to complete a process called alkalization. It regulates the juice's pH level and helps clarify it. In reaction to the lime, the juice's color changes from brown to yellow. Next, the juice goes into these clarifier tanks. It takes over two hours for the juice to settle and for the impurities to fall to the bottom of the tank. A sample taken from the tank shows how the sludge collects at the bottom while the clarified juice collects at the top. Next, we'll see how this clarified juice transforms into flowing crystals of white sugar.
workers filter the residue, known as mud. There's no waste here. The mud will fertilize the cane fields, and the bagasse will be burned as fuel. The clarified juice collected from the clarifier tanks now boils in a series of evaporators. This brings the concentration of the sugar in the juice up from 15% to 60%. Then the juice collects in 15-ton tanks to clarify even more. Any sediment left in the juice floats to the top. A rotating paddle skims this residue off to the sides of the tank. These tanks produce a type of syrup that goes on for still more processing. Workers now pour microscopic sucrose crystals suspended in alcohol into the syrup. This milky solution binds to the sugar present in the syrup and helps draw it out. Next, it all boils in large vacuum pans, forming sugar crystals. As the water in the syrup boils away, workers regularly check to see how the sugar is crystallizing. The goal? To produce a thick crystallized paste known as masquit. It then goes into a high-speed centrifugal machine to remove the sugar crystals from the uncrystallized syrup. Inside, the sugar spins at 1200 revolutions per minute. This action draws the molasses to the outer shell of the machine while the crystals remain in the inner basket. Sprays of water wash the crystals, then the water is drawn out so that only the crystals remain. This centrifuge works much the same way as a washing machine set on the spin cycle. It draws out moisture from the sugar, much like you draw out the wash water from a load of laundry. Next, a conveyor belt carries the sugar crystals out of the centrifuge. This mill produces raw sugar, which has a higher molasses color and is unbleached, and plantation white sugar, which has less molasses and is bleached a brilliant white. The sugar on the conveyor now goes into a large dryer. Hot air blows into this dryer to bring the sugar's humidity level down to 0.02%. That's standard for table sugar. The dried sugar pours out of the dryer into a bag on a scale. It's full when it weighs in at 1,000 kilos. A hoist then carries the bags to a platform at the far end of the packing facility. At 3,000 kilos, that's a heavy load. It lowers each bag over a chute that leads to the factory's main floor. Workers carefully open each bag in turn and pour out the sugar directly into the chute. It feeds an automated packaging machine which fills a series of two kilo plastic bags, seals them and separates them. This packing facility produces 200,000 bags a day. That means processing 400 tons of white sugar daily. This fine plantation white sugar is available in a variety of convenient packaging options. And that should sweeten anyone's day.